Welcome to So and So, brought to you by Bernina, made to create. I'm Meg Goodman, and you're about to enjoy a casual conversation with a special member of the Sewist and Quilting community. A conversation about how they got started, what inspires them, what excites them, and their connection to this community. Our guest today is Yvette Todd, who together with her husband, Doug, founded and runs Stash Hub, a purpose-built sewing organizer app designed to help get on top of sewists' fabric stashes, organize patterns, and plan sewing projects on the go. Stash Hub, in fact, is currently celebrating its one-year anniversary. A self-taught sewist and dressmaker since 2020, Yvette has been an active member of the sewing community, hosted sewing challenges, and bought her fair share of fabric along the way. Yvette grew up in Portsmouth and attended university at the University of Bath, where she met her husband. Yvette, hello and welcome to So and So. Hi Meg, thanks so much for having me on the show. It's such an honor to be included among your incredible guests. Well, thank you for that. Well, it feels like I'm just here, like I'm so right near the start of my own sewing journey and my business journey, so it just is so exciting to be here. Well, what's what's interesting is is you are a sewist, and we're going to talk about that. But this is going to have a little different spin on it because of what you and your husband Doug have created. And honestly, and until I I got to know you and read about this, I didn't understand that, uh, or didn't even know that this was a, a problem. But um, I guess it is pervasive. So we're going to learn all about that. Um, I'd like to learn more about you first, though. So tell us about your childhood where you grew up and, and what things interested you when you were a kid. Yeah, so um, as you can probably tell from my accent, I'm British. So I grew up near Portsmouth, which is on the south coast of the UK. And as a kid, like I always had a creative spark and I dabbled in like a few different crafts. And um, so my grandmother was like a painter as a hobby. So I did little bits of painting with her and I did a cross-stitch club when I was at primary school, so like age seven to 11 made some photo album scrapbooks with my mum. And I did learn some machine sewing at school um, in textiles lessons, but they were horrible. I hated them. Uh, The teacher was really mean and the projects were really, really boring. So I made some juggling balls, but I can't juggle. So that was like no fun. (laughs) So yeah, (laughs) my my teenage self would not believe what I was doing now, I think. Sure. You know, it's, it's, um, it's interesting. Many of the sewists that we've talked to, began doing other crafts. So there was that creative streak in them. And you are self-taught as a sewist. And it's really recent for you. In fact, you started sewing in 2020. So I'm curious, why did you decide to learn how to sew? And how did you teach yourself to do it? So weirdly, my sewing journey was inspired by rats. Rats as in rodents? Yeah. Okay. So Doug and I adopted some pet rats in 2019. And one weekend I was like, I'm just going to make them some like hammocks and things for their cage. So we just went to like the local like big box craft store, bought an inexpensive sewing machine and some fleece. And I kind of figured it out myself, like how to make some hammocks and little things to go in their cage. And it kind of all blew up from there, really. I've never heard of anybody who created rat hammocks. You're probably <laughs> not the only one. But the first that I heard of. So so you started with something simple like that. How did you teach yourself to do things that were more complex? So from the rat hammocks, I mean, rats are a great first customer because whatever you make, they'll just chew it anyway. So it, they don't have any standards. <laughs> um, but from there, I did some like YouTube tutorials, like classic, you know, beginner projects like tote bags, tried a bit of upcycling. And um, I, I got really into like buying clothes uh, from like charity shops online and then Mm -hmm. trying to make them fit um but I I bought this my first pattern book at the start of 2020 and that really kick-started my dressmaking journey so that's mostly what I do now uh use patterns to make clothes was there anybody in your life of that that um was an inspiration to your your sewing kind of help you along the way not particularly like nobody in my family is I'd say like into sewing um, but my husband, Doug's always been like really supportive. So he, you know, when I had my crazy idea that I was just going to buy a sewing machine to make rat hammocks, he was like, yeah, go for it. It'll be, it'll be fun. 
So yeah, he's been really supportive, but I kind of just figured it out, you know, myself along the way. And I think that's why kind of getting engaged with the sewing community online has been so important to me because it's been, it's, you know, given me people to engage with and talk to about sewing when I don't have already know people that do it, if that makes mm-hmm. sense. Oh, absolutely. Now, after you graduated university um, and before starting Stash Hub, you did some things. What, what did you do prior to founding Stash Hub? So I studied biochemistry at university. So, so did Doug as well. Um, so we're both kind of self-taught on this whole different path now. Um, so since graduating from university, I've worked as a lab technician. So I was actually working full time in a lab in London until a couple of months ago when I've taken the plunge and started working full time on Stash Hub. That's, uh, that's quite a change. Now, Doug is an IT guy. Uh, he, he codes during the day and, and works on your app at night. And you do stash up full time. So that's that's quite a, a switch from biochemistry. Yeah. What gave you the idea for Stash Hub? So Stash Hub's been a joint project between me and my husband Doug, like basically since the start, like to the extent that I think the whole thing was his idea and he thinks it was my idea. Um, but I think it was quite evident from right near the start of my sewing journey that the pace of fabric shopping tends to outstrip the pace of actually sewing it up. And also like, because I learned how to sew during the pandemic, I was kind of limited to buying fabric online, but I actually, that's my preferred way to shop now because you get so much more information like about, you know, the type of fabric and the composition. And I'd always wanted to like have a way of keeping that information because it's quite helpful to learn about fabric. Um, cause I, you know, before sewing, I had no idea how ignorant I was about fabric, you know, it'd be like, oh yeah, that t-shirt's nice and soft. And then, you know, looking back at it and looking in the label, you're like, okay, that's a viscose jersey. But you just, I just never thought about it when mm-hmm. I was buying my clothes. So, you know, when I started buying fabric, I was like, I need to, you know, remember what this is in case I want to buy something similar. So I started out using Trello, which a lot of people use and it works okay, but it's not purpose designed for sewing so uh, where Doug is self-taught at coding he likes to have a project to work on to like learn new skills which is probably quite relatable for people who sew as well it's much more fun to you know make a dress with a zip than it is to just practice putting in loads of zips so yeah he was like oh I can make an app that helps you organize your stash and so he did that and it was really good and I was like I think we should make this available for the rest of the sewing community and that's kind of where we are now so you, you say your mission is to help sewers um, beat being overwhelmed and fall back in love with their stash. So that's telling me that, that this is a, a problem. Um, talk more about this for us. Yeah, so it's just something that I really kind of picked up on in the sewing community, like mostly on Instagram is where I spend a lot of time. But so many sewers that I speak to have like negative feelings around their stash, like especially their fabric collection, like they're embarrassed to admit how much they have, or they feel like it's sort of become too much and just managing it is more like stressful than it is in inspiring them to make projects. So I think, and I think it's a very personal thing as well. Like there's not a specified threshold where your stash is like suddenly too big. I think a perfect stash can look different for different people. And it's just a case of, figuring out what works for you and like not comparing yourself to other people as well. You know, in, in many of the, um, the sewing and quilting conferences that we've attended for this podcast, I've met many people who sew, who see fabric and just shop because they think it's the coolest thing they ever bought. And they walk out with arms full of fabric, probably not knowing what they're going to do with it. Um, and then they get home and they have piles of, of fabric. What do you recommend people do if this is their case and they have Stash Hub as a tool? I mean, I think the, the shopping is, is something that everyone can relate to, like especially, you know, if you see a fabric that is like limited edition or dead stock, you're like, I have to get this fabric now or I'll never have it. And uh, probably for quilting, it's even worse as well because you feel like, Oh, well, I'm going to have to get this whole collection to put together for a quilt. So it is just so easy to accumulate things. Um, I think like, so we've had 
a, a, a lot of people have said that, you know, the process of cataloging their stash has helped them like rediscover pieces that they've forgotten about and then inspire projects that they can use with that fabric that they already had rather than them just thinking, oh, I'll just buy something new because I can't, you know, face all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'm a big believer that like, you know, even if your whole collection is overwhelming, like individually, every piece of fabric you have, you have for a reason, like you chose it or you were given it. And so, you know, to, to it, you know, the process is like trying to help people connect with that fabric on like an individual level and then, you know, help people decide if they want to use it rather than it just sort of sitting in their in their house, like taking up space. So, so you say connect with the, the fabric on an individual level. Um, that really makes sewing or quilting very personal. Yeah, and I, I think it, it really is because, um, you know, when, when you look at everything that, that the community has made, it, it's people, everyone's got their own ideas, like no two versions of the pattern come out the same. And I think this is one of the reasons as well why people can get so bogged down in their stash because every piece of fabric that you've got you have some kind of an emotional connection to like maybe you bought it at an event or you got it on holiday or someone gave it to you so it can be really difficult to get rid of stuff and I think for anyone that's crafty as well you can get into that thing where you're like oh well you know I don't have a plan for this but it might be useful for something so you just end up with so much stuff and so with the process of cataloging things in Stash Hub, it's more just like, you know, helping people acknowledge what they've got and hopefully get inspired by that rather than, you know, just, you know, have being faced by this whole huge collection that's just a bit too much to process all in one go. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about your husband, Doug. He's a software engineer and he does all of the coding for Stash Hub. How's it going working with your spouse? Really, really well. Um, I, it sounds quite cliche, but we are like best friends as well as husband and wife. So, yeah, we're really fortunate that we get to work together. And as well, I think the experience has like added a new layer to our relationship because we've had to learn a new way to communicate, like to give each other sort of business feedback in a way that's like, you know, sort of direct and effective. But then, you know, we're not taking things personally. Um, and I, and I think that's probably more on me than on him, but I, I can struggle with taking feedback when I'm like, oh, okay, you don't like it then. Um, but yeah, it's been really good to like have each other to like bounce ideas off. Mm -hmm. um, but we also, we run sort of different areas of the business. So Doug does all the coding and the sort of technical side of things. And I do like the social media and the marketing. So it's not like we're sort of stepping on each other's toes, but um, yeah, I mean, Doug's always very supportive, so I can always like run ideas by him, which is excellent. And and I want um, those sharing our conversation today to know that on your website, there is a really lovely picture of the two of you. So we're going to talk at the end of this podcast about how to find that. Um, but I, um, it is really nice and it's it's worth people visiting. Tell us how your business has evolved. You're celebrating one year. Um, so how has it changed over this past year? So in terms of the app, we've added like so many new features to Stash Hub over the year. So we, even though we launched like a year ago, there's just so many like new ideas, like some that we've had, some have been requested from the people that use Stash Hub. So originally Stash Hub was only available on like iPhone and Android, but Doug developed a web version. So you can use it on your computer now as well, which has been really popular. Um, and one of the coolest new features that we've added is Magic Input, uh, which we're actually uh, just releasing a new update for that. So you can paste, like if you're buying fabric online, you can just take the URL of that fabric page, paste in the web link, and then all the information just gets extracted. So it makes it much quicker to upload your stash because I think that's something that puts a lot of people off the idea of cataloging their stash that it's going to take a lot of time. So we're working on you know improvements to that flow all the time mm -hmm. in in terms of our business model like that hasn't changed over the year we're still running the stash hub app without ads um and there's a free version that you can use to like basically test out the app so you can add up to like 20 records of each type so like fabrics and patterns and notions uh, and then you can subscribe either for like a year or a month if you want to add more of your collection 
Um, but next year, we're hoping to start collaborating with some other small businesses in the sewing community. So, yeah, stay tuned for that. Hopefully a lot more exciting stuff coming up. Sounds like it. Now, you mentioned that you do the social media and you host weekly interviews on Instagram Live and you call them stash chats. Um, and during these, you talk to members of the sewing community about their sewing collection. Can you share some of the stories from these chats? Yeah, definitely. So the, running the stash chats has been really fun and I've, I've shared them to YouTube as well so people can watch them afterwards, even though they are sort of recorded live. Um, but I kind of just started it as a way to like open up conversations about stashes to, you know, because people can feel so embarrassed about their own collection and they don't want to talk about it. Um, but my favourite fabric story that comes to mind is from the episode where I spoke to Marie, who's the Stitch Odyssey on Instagram. And I asked her, what is the most precious fabric in your stash? And she showed us this hand-woven silk that her great-grandmother had made in Cyprus. So her great-grandmother, like, farmed the land all day, raised five kids, and then she raised these silkworms herself as well. Oh, and, like, my. Yeah, huh. it's just incredible. Like, so the fabric, she made it as part of, like, Marie's grandmother's dowry. Um, and apparently Marie's grandmother wasn't too impressed by just getting loads and loads of fabric. Um, but yeah, how amazing that Marie was able to inherit this legacy of all this fabric that's been made by hand. Um, and yeah, she said she used some of it to make this like 1920s inspired blouse. And I'll, um, I've asked Marie actually, and she says you can include a picture for the show notes. Um, but yeah, she's got, she's got more of this fabric and she's not sure what to do with it now. She's a bit scared in case she ruins it. You know, and, and that's probably something she'll just hold on to or maybe even in the community work with somebody uh, to do something. Now, um, many of the guests that we've had on this podcast um, shared a lot with their community. And many times the stories have gone beyond the reasons they gather. Uh, they've gone into things that have happened to their in their lives, good things, bad things, challenges. Um, have you shared any life stories with members other than sewing? So honestly, like sewing is, is pretty much my life right now. Now I'm working on the stash hub and that's like all my hobby as well. But I, I tend not to share like too much of my personal life, like publicly on my social media. But I have been lucky enough to like make some really close friends like through the sewing community. So I've got this friend, Natalie, who I bonded with her like on Instagram because we always were buying the same fabric. So now we're like sewing besties. So I basically, I message her every day and we visited each other like in person, even though we live like 250 miles apart. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, she, uh, she had to have some surgery at some point. So then I was kind of, you know, supporting her through that. And that's been, been really amazing that I've managed to, you know, make some genuine friends in my life, like through sewing. Tell us more about the community you've created with this app. It sounds like it's rather notable. Uh, and um, you've bonded with people that you may never meet in person. Tell us, tell us more about this. Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the things that really got me into sewing, like from the start. So well, I had my first pattern book, and I was, you know, making my first project, and then I like managed to sew through my finger, which I'm sure a lot of people <laughs> have done. But I think. It, that would have probably been enough to put me off and I would have been like I'm just never going to sew again but then I was like but now but then I wouldn't be able to like you know I was just right on the cusp of like really getting into it. I was like you know I need to make things so I can share them and then I can talk to other people about it so it, it really encouraged me like even though there, you know all these people just out in the world just never knew that I existed I was just like I really need to get engaged with this like sewing community on Instagram so that's something that I've really focused on with Stash Hub, like building a community on Instagram and sharing things that are, you know, fun and useful for people. Mm -hmm. uh, and we also have a Facebook group called Stash Hub Club. Um, so we've been able to open up conversations about people's sewing collections and share ideas and things. Um, but one of my favorite things is that the community has extended beyond like just Stash Hub and we've been able to like contribute towards charity projects as well. So I think like sewing people, I don't know, just I just get the impression everyone's so like thoughtful and generous and it's just been amazing. So we've teamed up with Mel, who runs this weekly sewing sessions at a refugee center, which is local to me. So part of the stash cataloging process is like identifying fabrics that 
you realistically aren't going to use. So sewists have then sent that fabric as donations to be used by Mel's refugees in these sessions. So it's basically a win-win because it's like an easy way to de-stash fabric you're not going to use. And it also helps like bring sewing to people who wouldn't have that opportunity without these donations. When we talk later, please make sure that uh, you tell us how to get in touch with Mel's charity, because I like your term about de-stashing fabric. And I'm thinking there might be people joining us on this conversation today who would like to to participate in that as well. Yeah. So we'll make sure that uh, we know how to get in touch with uh, with Mel. Yeah, definitely. And also, if any of listeners know of any other kind of similar projects that need fabric donations, like around the world, like let me know as well. And I could maybe create a directory because, it's, you know, I think people abroad, it's going to be too expensive to like ship stuff for donations, but there must be other things happening elsewhere in the world as well. So that'll be really good to hear about those. Matter of fact, there are. We've, we've talked about some of them on this podcast. Uh, and we will look back and also bring up some of the websites uh, where where people can send their um, de-stashed fabric as well. Brilliant. Um, Yvette, when we connected uh, and talked about you joining on this podcast, you said you just love to talk about sewing. What about sewing makes you feel this way? I feel like with sewing, like it's like I finally found my thing. Like Because I've, I've tried lots of other crafts and hobbies, but I've never felt like, so passionate so like fanatical about one sort of thing before and I think I just love that there's so many different angles to sewing like you know it can be something you do that's practical or it can be historical or it can connect you to different cultures or be sustainable or be about your personal style and I think everyone's just got a different approach and um, different ideas and so there's just always so much to learn by like talking to people about sewing and like what part of it interests them what inspires you? I just, I love color. So it's really good to be able to like incorporate color into my own wardrobe, especially like in the winter. Like I always hated going shopping and, you know, in the winter and everything's just like brown and gray and you're like, oh, this is just like too sad to wear. So, um, and then but like now with the fabric that's available to buy, I can just incorporate that color into my wardrobe all the time and it has changed the way that I dress as well like I wear dresses a lot more than I did and like being able to have clothes that fit me I think is really um you know it's just a good feeling as well to to have clothes that that fit you and look good um yeah I just I just love seeing like what everyone else is making as well like you just get so many ideas and discover new new patterns and everything there's just so much out there. Mm-hmm. Do you make the majority of your clothing now? I do now, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't make underwear, but I am hoping to make my first bra soon. Mm-hmm. So I've got the pattern and I've got the fabric. Um, I'm not convinced yet to make like underpants. I don't know if I can be bothered. <laughs> um, but yeah, mostly everything I make now. Um, and I think it's really funny, like be, being in a different sphere so like I think normally if someone's like you know just out in the street they're like oh I like your outfit and people can be a bit shy about saying they made it but if you go to a sewing event like an exhibition or a show or something where all the people there are sewing people they'll be like oh I love your outfit did you make it and if people haven't made their outfit then they feel that way like more dubious to talk about it Mm -hmm, it's just really funny (laughs) um Yvette what's next for you so I mean I think carrying on with stash hub hopefully this is um this is a dream that we can be able to like both work full time on it and just spread the word about the app so that everyone knows that they could um you know catalog their collection and not feel overwhelmed by it and besides working on stash hub do you have another dream or is is this this where you're going to focus so i'm going to tell you my like crazy out there dream okay so Have you seen the show The Home Edit? I have not. Okay, so it's basically these two ladies and they go to people's houses and then they just organize their house. Mm -hmm. But I would love to do that for people's like sewing collections and like organize all their fabric so it's all like neat and they know what they've got and um, then they can just like do the sewing and not have to do all the organizing because I just love 
that process like myself and like celebrate everything that they've made and that they've got. So if you've got any Netflix producers listening, I'm, I'm waiting for their call. <laughs> and and we often do. So we'll we'll look for for you to have that show. And it, um, y- you know, what would be interesting is is people tell the stories of their fabrics. Yeah. Um, and what they mean to them. And I think you've got something there. I really well, do. I think like the like everyone who sews loves fabric. It's like a massive part of it. So and like people are like naturally curious about everyone else's like collection as well. So I think it could be a hit and I'm up for it. So that's that's what my dream is. We'll look forward to that. Um, we've talked about a lot today. Is there any question I didn't ask you that you wish I had? Oh, um, no, I don't think so. Yeah. You didn't, you haven't asked me about my, my sewing stash. Um, right. Well, tell us about that. So I've got about 50 fabrics in my personal stash and obviously they're all on Stash Hub and I have to, I have to keep buying fabric as, uh, you know, business purposes. <laughs> of course. Um, but yeah, I definitely gravitate a lot to like, you know, blues and greens. I'm so I, cause I'm a redhead. So I think that's just easy for me to wear. Um, but yeah, also florals, like I have to be really mindful that I don't just like keep buying blue florals that are all the same. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I often will show my husband, Doug, a fabric that I like the look of and just be like, what do you think about this? Just to see his response, because sometimes he'll be like, oh, don't you already have this fabric? And that's how I know that maybe I don't need that one. Mm-hmm. So he keeps your, your stash grounded in that you don't have 50 of the same thing. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I mean, even sometimes if he disapproves, I'll, I'll still buy it if I really like it. If he doesn't have the final say. Sure, sure. You know, this has been so much fun today. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, if our listeners want to reach out to you, uh, what's the best way for them to do that? So we're at stash underscore hub on Instagram. Or if you want to email us, it's hello at stashhubapp.com. Um, and if you want to join our Facebook group, that's Stash Hub Club on Facebook. We'll look forward to keeping an eye on you and, uh, and what's to come with Stash Hub. Yvette, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me. It's been a really good show. I've enjoyed it. Well, there you have it. Another story about someone just like you, someone for whom sewing and quilting is so much more than a hobby. It's a way of life and a connection to something bigger. If you know someone you think has an outstanding story, a story that should be shared on this podcast, please drop me a note to maggotsoandsopodcast.com or just complete the form on our website. Be sure to subscribe to, review, and rate this podcast on your favorite platform and visit our website, soandsopodcast.com, for more information about today's and all of our guests. That's S-E-W-A-N-D-S-O podcast.com. And finally, I want to thank Bernina for making this program possible. I'm Meg Goodman, and I look forward to you joining us next time on So-and-So. So-and-so.